sensors were placed in various spots. This was dangerous and hard work because they had to go inside the block every time and search for the most suitable spots that would reliably diagnose the condition of the fourth block. At the same time, videos and photos of the rooms of the fourth block were taken continuously, which allowed the engineers to select the proper solutions for the construction of the sarcophagus itself. During this, the project team from Nipiet, the Leningrad Design Institute of the Ministry of Media and Machine Building, was working on site in Chernobyl. Even though the general design had been developed at the Institute, an array of design decisions were made there, on the spot. An absolutely enormous amount of work was done by comrade Kurnosov, the chief engineer of this project, and the chief engineer of the Institute itself. He regularly found proper solutions when any difficult situation arose. And there were difficult situations. An attempt to pour concrete in an area was unsuccessful because there were rather large gaps through which the concrete flowed to the levels below. Methods to hold the concrete in place had to be thought of. Some supports were not strong enough and reinforcement was necessary. This harmonious work of the researchers and the designers, in the end, led to a reliable construction. That was one group of tasks. Another set of tasks was performed by the construction experts from the Ministry of Energy who were building a temporary village called Green Cape. Many prefabricated houses were ordered, made both in Finland and in the Soviet Union. And for the shift workers that had to work in the first and second blocks, a very nice village was constructed with all the needed amenities, with houses, with shops, with cultural facilities. This village had been constructed literally in a few months. Boris Yadokimovich Rubina was personally following the construction of this village, paying attention not only to the places to sleep after work, but also that there should be flowers, that the canteen worked as well as in any other part of the Soviet Union, and that the people felt comfortable there. These divisions of the Ministry of Energy had taken part in the construction of the village at Green Cape and also in the construction of many stations for the decontamination of vehicles, quite a lot of which had gathered on a site by then. The government commission itself had already been relocated by this time. The work was as before done in Chernobyl in the former regional party committee building but the living accommodations were moved approximately 50 kilometers away from Chernobyl. The leaders of the government commission, as well as the various experts that were arriving to perform certain tasks, lived there. A large group of researchers from various organizations of the Soviet Union, from the Academy of Sciences, from the Khrushchev Institute of Nuclear Energy, this whole group of researchers was working on a detailed assessment of the radioactive contamination of the area. For this, they used both statistically reliable samples that were gathered on the site, followed by analysis in the radiochemical laboratories that had been deployed in Chernobyl. And some samples were sent to the Radio Institute or the Institute of Nuclear Energy. Measurements of gamma fields were taken using helicopters. The surveys were done for both the total amount of gamma radiation and the isotope spectrum of gamma radiation. And correlations were found between the contents of individual isotopes by using relative contents of which we could predict the concentration of, for example, plutonium that was released into the environment. Of course, samples of plutonium, as well as other heavy alpha-active elements, were collected continuously to compare the data gathered by the helicopters and through the direct collection. The responsibilities were distributed in such a way that everything that was outside the 30-kilometer zone 
was controlled both from the air and from the ground by the State Committee on Hydrometeorology, led by member correspondent Yuri Antonovich Israel. I cannot exactly tell how much time he spent in Chernobyl and took the most thorough part in the data collection, their correct estimation, researching the history of the appearance of contamination spots. An enormous amount of work had been done, and as a result, outside the 30-kilometer zone, we were receiving more and more precise maps that showed the degree of contamination of various areas. And within that 30-kilometer zone, the talk was mostly about cesium contamination, because several cesium spots had appeared and the creation of cesium maps began in the period from the date of the accident until the 20th of May, after which the creation of such maps was stopped. According to existing sanitary norms, decisions were taken that set the maximum limits for radiation exposure that allowed people to live in areas contaminated by certain isotopes. The local authorities acted according to these rules, either relocating people or letting them stay, switching to imported food, or declaring the area safe enough to live in and to use the land. At the same time, the State Agro-Industrial Committee and the experts from the Ministry of Media Machine Building were also carrying out analysis of various agriculture crops, determining the degree of their contamination, observing the forests and fields around the Chernobyl station, both within a 30-kilometer zone and around it. As for the 30-kilometer zone itself, it was under the charge of the experts from the Ministry of Nuclear Energy, the experts from the Khrushchev Institute, experts from the Radium Institute, and the experts from the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. In September, the work of the Substitute Government Commission had ended. All the work was transferred to the revised composition of the first Government Commission, the one led by Boris Yevdokimovich Rubina, that had been approved. And subsequently, from September onwards, all the work on the site of the Chernobyl station and within the contaminated zone was the responsibility of the Government Commission. It made all the decisions, reviewed all the projects, all the comments, and led all the work. The order of operations was approximately as follows. Around the beginning of September, the evacuation efforts had been generally completed and the evacuees were placed in the newly constructed villages. Some of the station personnel got flats in Kiev city and some in Chernikov. All in all, the accommodation issues had been solved. A decision was made to build the city of Slavutich because it was clear from the beginning that the shift work method could only be used temporarily at the nuclear power plant. And so the design of the new city of Slavutich began, the city that would replace Pripyat as the permanent residence for the power engineers. The period of August and September was a period of active preparation to launch the first and second blocks of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This launch was carried out successfully. Moreover, before launching these blocks, an entire complex of measures developed by experts to further increase the safety of such types of stations was implemented and tested, partially on the first block and fully on the second block. This was sort of the main task in that period. Concurrently, with the preparation for the launch of the first and second blocks, and with performing the launch operations, work was underway on the construction of the sarcophagus. The original deadline for this construction was at the end of September, but various issues that naturally came up prevented this work from being completed in time. But I will repeat, this was because of unforeseen circumstances came up constantly. There were very large gaps that could not hold the concrete, preventing it from hardening and making it impossible to set up the base for the subsequent construction elements. There were problems with selecting the appropriate material that would close the gaps between the components of the pipe cover. 
it was necessary to design a force ventilation system for the sarcophagus so that if there was not enough natural ventilation, it would be possible to remove heat by switching on the forced one. All these issues were gradually solved during the design phase and were refined during the construction of the sarcophagus of the fourth block. This construction was a separate saga in itself. The project teams were working on the spot. The work was done with the help of two cranes made in the German Federal Republic by the firm De Mug. The primary work was being done using these cranes, but still many finishing tasks that would increase the reliability of the sarcophagus had to be done by hand or by using various robotic devices. However, as I have already said, the robotic devices we had, be it our own or acquired from abroad, turned out to be practically useless in those conditions. Say, even if a robot had sufficiently reliable electronics, it could not overcome obstacles that were the result of a large amount of wreckage of the fourth block and stopped. This was the reason they were unusable. If, however, the researchers received robots that had good all-terrain travel capability in the most difficult conditions, then their electronics would fail because of the high gamma radiation and they also stopped. So there we were, trying to use robots to clean the contaminated roofs of buildings where the third and the fourth blocks were and also the roof of the reactor of the radioactive contamination. We tried to use robots, but this generally was not very successful. The best technical devices were created by experts from NIKIMT, the Research and Design Institute of Assembly Technology. Yurchenko Yuri Fedorovich was the director of this organization. He himself spent a lot of time on the site, and under his leadership the robots were created, tested and used. But well, what kind of robots? Ordinary ordinary bulldozers and scrapers, but reinforced with lead sheets to protect the driver inside, and such vehicles were used to the majority of the contamination work in the most difficult places. The army divisions were primarily used to decontaminate large areas of the station territory and the insides of the station buildings. They worked very diligently with great speed and efficiency. Of course, many things changed as time passed, our views and ways of working. I remember an episode when we arrived at Pripyat with General Kunchevich. It seemed that it would be impossible to decontaminate the city because everywhere one went, there were very high levels of radiation, say 500 to 800 millirongens per hour. This was the magnitude of the doses that we measured with our devices. But then we did one thing. We broke off pieces of facing from one of the buildings and took them from Pripyat to Chernobyl. And it turned out that this facing was radiating 800 millirongens per hour. But here in Chernobyl, it radiated less than 10 millirongens per hour. So it became clear that the contamination sources were not widely spread but rather there were local sources of contamination in Pripyat that created a general environment that made it seem like the decontamination was not possible. After we figured this out, and after the most active isotopes had already decayed, then mainly around August-September, very active work began, carried out by the military organizations to decontaminate Pripyat. And the city of Pripyat was substantially decontaminated by about the same time when the sarcophagus construction was ending. While constructing the sarcophagus, we solved the problem of how to close the gaps. The following decisions were taken. Deep asbestos sacks filled with polyethylene chips into appropriate solutions. These would produce foam and then use these sacks to close the gaps on the roof of the sarcophagus. But even before the work on the sarcophagus ended, work began on checking the condition of the equipment in the third block. The question arose about what to do with the fifth and sixth block. These were the questions we had. Around October 1986, 
the situation regarding word distribution was very clear. One department of the Ministry of Media Machine Building was completing the construction of the sarcophagus, which was later named Shelter. The builders from the Ministry of Energy were occupied with the construction of the shift village at Green Cape and some tasks related to the creation of a decontamination station inside the 30 km zone and some work on the territory of the station itself. Minia Tomo Energo led the work on the preparations to launch the first and second blocks and had already started to gradually make their way into the third block to assess its condition. The Army Divisions, together with the organizations of the Ministry of Media Machine Building, were cleaning the roofs of the building where the third and fourth blocks of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant were. The military divisions were also continuing with the decontamination of the villages that were within the 30 km zone. The research group, as I have already said, had divided its task as follows. Researching the wreckage of the fourth block, finding the fuel and surrounding it with the maximum number of diagnostic devices. The diagnostic devices were inserted from under the fourth block. For the bubbler rooms, the diagnostic elements were inserted through the holes drilled into the side walls that led to the reactor hole. And the bulk of the diagnostic devices were inserted from above hung on special ropes inside the reactor hole. At the same time, another group of researchers was occupied with another task, specifically studying the migration of radionuclides inside the 30 km zone and around it. We were concerned by the question, how deep do the radionuclides penetrate after they are deposited on the surface? How are they absorbed? Different techniques for the artificial absorption of radionuclides on the surfaces were tested. The problems of preventing the radionuclides from getting into the Pripyat River were solved. Measures were taken to prevent the radionuclides from getting into the groundwater. Within the last field, the actions were quite simple. Around 150 wells were constructed, both diagnostic and service wells. The diagnostic wells worked continuously and measured the radioactivity of the groundwater and if required the service wells could be turned on to pump out the contaminated water. But fortunately during the entire period of work and to this day all the diagnostic wells have shown that the groundwater has always been clean and the service wells have never been used. Complex research was done in the cooling pond near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant where the radioactivity of the water as well as silt was measured and a lot of attention was paid to the condition of the Pripyat river itself, the Kiev reservoir. But it was very quickly discovered that the water itself did not have much contamination but the sediment beneath it was affected and the concentration of radioactive elements in the sediment under the cooling pond was up to 10 to power 5 curie, while the concentration of radioactivity in the water was no more than 10 to the power of 8 or 10 to the power of 9 curie per liter.